over to about two years, the archives group held good practice workshops across England and Wales and Scotland, sorry, so that we could gauge the present knowledge of those working in archaeological archives and to raise awareness amongst those working in the profession. Workshops came to close in July 2014 and a plenary session was held in September 2014 to look at the results and to ascertain where the future of archives lie as far as we were concerned. So. I want to look at whether, as the session might suggest, as some, some of the out of the might suggest, that the situ as the situation stands, people think that this is a glass half empty, that people are very pessimistic about the way archives are. I want to see whether we're heading for a bleak future, and I want to see whether this is true. It has been suggested that contractors and museums should just get a large skip, contract the whole lot in a large skip, and forget about it. Rather than heading and put it in the nearest landfill, rather than heading for the nearest salt mine. I think no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping to show you that people are keen on looking at their archives and whether they're actively and that we are actively seeking answers. Okay. Uh, I don't know how many of you went to workshops or how many people are aware of what the workshops were about. The workshops were held, were set up so that we wanted to see whether people who work in the profession, so we looked at, we had planning archaeologists, we had contractors, we had museum archaeologists, we had consultants, we had fine specialists and community archaeologists. We wanted people to gain knowledge of other people's roles, not their own. We wanted people to look at how other people worked. We had 15 workshops plus one pilot over to two years, and we had at that time we had over 200 attendees. Uh, at these workshops, we held and we obviously had feedbacks and we held, had the immediate results. These are some of the things that people said about the workshops that they were useful, that they were how, uh, informative, but they were frustrating. Mm. I don't think they found the workshops frustrating, I think they found the situation frustrating as to how things were and the importance of checking, checking an archive. One of the most important things, there was still a lack of communication between organisations. One of the things we were very aware of, the reason we set them up, is that within, they were held regionally, so that you would have a county archaeologist from, say, my county in Bedfordshire, you'd have the units who worked in that county, and they'd all speak to each other, and you'd find that they hadn't ever spoken to each other properly, some of these people, and they hadn't spoken to the museums. And what we wanted to do is have people from all of those areas <coughs> actually meeting for the first time in some cases. So these are some of the questions we ask people. What, if anything, do you think you've learnt from as whole? Uh, there are many different areas of archiving and they, they don't know what each other are up to. That seems to be quite a common complaint. Uh, that we learnt about the perspective from other heritage professionals. Uh, dialogue is an important and a common understanding of the crucial issues. I think one of the best things I found is one of the uh, the workshop, the first workshop we held in Hartford. The museum itself asked, "Why don't you have a clearer understanding on your website of what your archive depositions are?" Uh, the next week, on their website appeared a clear understanding of poor contractors of how to do their archives, what the cost was, what the size of the boxes, and <coughs> which museums collected. So I think an immediate result. Well, well, ah, training, yeah. <laughs> at the end of the workshops, we were the, we sent out follow uh, at the end of the whole series of workshops after two years, we sent out a, a follow up uh, survey to see where people now stood, and asked them, right, <laughs> which were forty seven people replied out of the two hundred that we sent the things to. Uh, which is perhaps about twenty five percent. It looks a bit skewed. We have quite a lot of Worcester, uh, although Chester looks quite small. Chester only had seven people go to their workshop. Six of them replied, "I didn't send that. I didn't do that. Helen actually did that, didn't you?" And I think, oh no, and I think that was a really good workshop. It must have been because they all replied. <laughs> so basically, the. Uh, I've gone too fast. Compiling an archive. What we got people to do in these workshops, we got them to 
do what they didn't normally do. So the checking and archive, which would normally be done by museum people, was done by planning archaeologists. We got planning archaeologists to actually check an archive. We got museum archaeologists or people working in museums because some of the people who didn't who came who came from the museum community weren't archaeological pe archaeology keepers, which was actually very useful because we were trying to show them also how things worked. And so we got them to compile an archive. We got contractors to use a digital archive. They're the ones that create one. They never then have to interrogate it. And so we got them to interrogate one of the uh, digital archives, and they had lots of problems. <laughs> what did you learn? A need of focus checking. Uh, how much time an archive checking takes. An appreciation how much work it can take. I like this. This makes me, this makes me when I'm the person compiling this archive, I like people to see, it takes me a long time to do an archive, and these are the reasons. And the need to make databases more understandable and in general make digital data clear. That's something that I've learned um, a, a lot of because obviously it's quite an important thing. How do you put into practice what you've learned? A bit disappointing. 55 said yes, 44% said no. Mm. Not sure about that. I'm not sure that's really what the result was we wanted. We really wanted, you know, even 85% would have been good. I'm not saying that you all have to have done it. So, uh, some of the things, how do you put into practice what you've learnt? I need to tweak my deposition standards. Um, the, I, I thought this was a bit of an odd one. Because I'm a curating museum, the archives are organised before they reach me. They should be, but they might not be. And what we were saying is, maybe they should have been. Uh, and then, this one's quite good. We're meeting, having a meeting in September with museum colleagues to form out best practice procedures. Excellent. That's what we want. Uh, only what one person said they didn't think it was very it was uh, useful to bring all the sectors together. Not sure they meant it quite like that. From what I understood and reread it, I think the person who said no said, "Well, no, because it's already good in my area." That wasn't really what we were asking, but that's okay. That's all right. Ninety-nine percent of people are almost saying it's okay. We're happy now. Yeah. Have you found it easier to communicate with colleagues? 70% said yes, 10, 20, still the same. I've not communicated with anyone. Four people. Sad, but okay. What have you learned? Again, this is after, a lot of these were after two people have done it two years ago. Some were only like, you know, six months and things like this. So it's, it's quite a mixed thing. Combination of archives isn't something to be frightened of. Well, okay, it depends who your archives are, really. As we were saying earlier, if you've got an archive that was done 20 years ago and that fills a whole warehouse, then it is something to be frightened of. <laughs> but only because it's an awful lot of work. It shouldn't be frightening, but it can be. Have you implemented things you have learned? And have you encouraged others to do so? Yay! Yes, all right. I like that. If yes. I think I like the way you said if yes. We didn't say if no, why not? <laughs> we were going for the positive spin. I'm a commissioner that has been used to having an understanding of what makes a good archive and what makes a bad archive. Check and check again. That's that's the thing. Uh, and then I haven't been given time to. The museum is currently closed for new archives. We're all finding a lot of that. We're all finding that museums are having to say to our contractors, sorry, we can't take any of your archives at the moment. Some it's a temporary thing, and some have just turned around and said, that's it, we're closing next week, all your archives. There's nothing you can do about it. It's the way it is, unfortunately, and this is partly what's going to go out of this, hopefully, what we're going to do. As these works have come to end, what's the way to put the people forward to those who have been unable? This is something we're very keen on doing. The archives group haven't got the time to continue the work, to keep doing the workshops. I think anyone that was going to come to them would have done by now, apart from any new people. But we don't want to stop people learning about it. We don't want it. We don't want to say, oh, that's it. We've solved it. We're fine. We're fine. 
So we're looking at maybe online training, whether we have training packed organisations, whether we go into universities and do training, whether we just go to one uh, archaeological contracting unit, or whether we go and say, right, we're going to just sit down with you, or whether we get contracting units within the unit. But the thing is, we want to make sure is that we're still reaching everyone. We're not just talking to units, we're not talking to museums, we want to talk to the planning archaeologists, we want to talk to consultants. We need to involve everybody, because, and, and community archaeologists, because that's something that we always forget. The community archaeologists have to be doing their archives too. We can't just turn around and say, I, yeah, please go and you know, do that site. They have to think at the funding, <coughs> they have to look at the archives, because they can't, it, it's still that important thing. So these are the things, uh, no one side fits all. Both the, we basically said, do you want a train pack, do you want on a, online? Mm -hmm. Uh, they wanted discussion with other. Oh, that's badly written, isn't it? Yeah. Our political <laughs> sectors. I'm so drunk. <laughs> Do you think follow up communication between the groups or organisations would be useful? Yes. One of the things that came out of one of the, group, uh, the sessions was that the people at that workshop decided to all exchange their emails so that they could have their own little group within where they were. And I think that's a useful thing, that having local organisations, things like the, I mean, the share works for that from the museum section, things like that, that you have some local uh, networking. So I think it's, uh, it is good. I mean, we all speak to each other, some of us speak to each other. It's the same, often uh, for things, it's the same people who speak to each other. And what we want to do is speak to people who aren't. Uh, so networking, we will have good relationship across the sector locally, which is what we want. The problem that contracting our organisations have is we don't work just one local. We work in lots of different locals. So it, it can be a difficult thing for those sorts of things. We can't have networks in here and here and here, but maybe we can. Uh, further days are aiming understanding evolving practice, particularly in the digital area. The digital is going to be the big issue, I think, in the future for how, it's, how we're going to tackle things. There have been several meetings for naval archaeologists and museum professionals to work together. Networking groups would be an advantage in order to talk directly. However, not anyone has time to do this. So do you meet social media. We'll come across social media in a moment. I used to laugh. At the workshops, we took the opportunity to join up everybody, even if they didn't ask, to join the IFA archives group. Whether they're a member of CIFA, as it now is, or not. If you're not a member of CIFA, you can join the group for £10. We included that in the cost of the thing. We managed to get 40-ish members, therefore, non CIFA members and all the others. And we had a really large number of people. We asked whether these people were still continuing to Some of them didn't, but some. So I think it's one thing that we actually managed to retain seven people, or something like this, into the group who weren't members of CIFA. What we're hoping is those members who weren't, who didn't rejoin, actually then join CIFA, which is part of what obviously we'd like people to do. We're still trying to recruit people. We still think we're one of the groups that has an opportunity to have more non-CIFA members because we have a lot of museum people in it. We want more museum people in it and a lot of them have their own societies. And I think we're, we, we are a group that can allow that more easily. Have you joined our Facebook page? No. Didn't know there was one, 55%. Some of our committee weren't sure there was one. So I don't think that's actually a bad thing. We have a Facebook page. It's not great because none of the committee that are at the moment are, shall we say, social networking people. So I think that's a slight issue. Uh, and, we, and we have a Twitter page now, although we don't run it. Somebody else runs it for us. <laughs> we do appreciate any of the comments you have. I think there was a pity there were so few from the Benelux Control Security Curator Hall side there. We had a real mix. Some some workshops we had a really good selection of different people. We had a lot of museum people, we had evenings. Others we had no museum people. We had oh the museum people were pretty much always represented. And contractors were generally always represented. It was mainly planning archaeologists, consultants and that weren't represented. Um, so I think, and then there was one, there was one where there was only one contracting organisation went to a unit. So I think it was it was a mix, and I think that was where, not that we failed, but we failed obviously to encourage the right some of the right people to come. 
So, committee. Well, some of us were being a bit optimistic, some were pessimistic, a few, yes, cautiously, cautiously pessimistic. I'm hoping, see, I'm a, I'm a reasonably optimistic person. Well, I am an optimistic person. <laughs> so I would, I, I, but I would still say, in place, I was still a bit cautiously optimistic. I think a lot of the group were. So this led to the plenaries, where we wanted to discuss what happened at the workshops and where the archive, what we can do now as a committee. So we held it. I told this because this is, it was a very tight room, <laughs> but it was a fantastic room. We held it. If anyone ever wants a place in London to hold a brilliant Tibet, the Karl Marx Memorial Library is fabulous. It has the best murals on the wall and it's all inspiring and it's great and it's got a really good cafe around the corner. And it's right next to Farringdon, very close to Farringdon Station. So it's really easy to get to and it's fantastic. But anyway, we had, <laughs> we had quite a lot of people who came to, we had 15-ish people came to the event. And what we then did is we spoke about the results of the workshops and then we put people this time into the groups of people they were normally with. So we had all the contractors sat together museum people sat together and then we had a mixed table which I think was Helen's table where we had the ADS, a fines people, uh, digital and things like that. We had a few other people, other people and what we asked each group to do it came up with was the five priorities that they want the archives committee now to tackle. Uh, we as a committee had come up with what we felt because the committee had representations from all these things. We have a museum people, we have contractors, we have a Duncan from EH, or as it was then, age. Uh, and we have Sam, I think that, so we had lots of people who already, who we represent lots of different areas that we had our ideas, and we wanted to see whether they matched what other people felt. So, the contractors decided these were their priority issues as to what they thought could be solved. So, they said, the lack of storage space, refusal and accepting or long-term curation, and that the long-term curation by units, that some archaeological units are having to store things because museums can't take them. We all know that's there. Uh, and in case, yeah, inconsistency of policies across the country, the guidelines, lack of understanding of archiving stage or what an archive is. This is because this was within, the, within their organisations often, in that some people feel they're not. Uh, supported by other organisations. Digital data, yeah, we all know digital data is going to be a massive issue. And a communication of issues both internal and external. If you remember, these are lots of different mixtures of people, so these were other, there were a lot of other issues that contracting units and other people had, but these were the five that they decided were the five priorities that could possibly be tackled. Museums. Museums decided that their priorities were a communication issue between everyone, between planetary, planning officers, repositories, uh, inside organisations, and that they felt there was a lack of training. Uh, digital, again, they put digital a bit higher up the thing, how data is stored, and the better use of data archiving to reduce the paper archive. Uh, and access to the process archives, many repositories are sorting out their systems. They felt that if people wanted to come and look at their archives, actually getting to them be quite a, could be an issue. Storage, not and, and this was good because they weren't looking at just their own storage. They also said this is storage with all all those places that we've got all the units who are holding things and they would like to be able to get to or that they realised that storage was a huge issue. And again, more training. Training within units and community groups and universities as to what a museum does, as to what the museum wants. Because we all say, we know what we think the museum wants because we've read your guidelines. A lot of people don't always talk to the museum. And this isn't just units, I to say. This is community groups. Community groups don't come and talk to some museums. And universities, again, academics who might hold on to their archives and then retire. And then their archives are there and it's in, in an issue. Others. Yeah, these were the, these were the mixture. This is quite an interesting one because there was a real mixture of people. They just came up with these things, and I should read out. Helen sent me some notes about this, which I thought was really good. So, digital archives. They felt they needed to be an engagement with the academics because, yeah, they ain't got a couple of pictures, luckily. <laughs> an engagement with academics. Uh, there was no consideration in tendering or planning 
for the projects. The extended oasis services need to be better understood. Now, oasis are get, getting themselves updated. I think some of us will have seen it on the thing, they're getting the heralds and things like this. So, I hope the oasis will be better, better with things. Uh, information for heritage organisations involved in archiving process needs to be provided. Data structures and cost of migration needs to be factored into deposition of archaeological archives. Um, information was just generally about information that had to be held. So it seems like boxes often come overloaded. Uh, in one case, this may lead to reduction of boxes due to physical prohibit overloading. So people would load up their boxes to get to the museum because of the cost implications. Backlogs, yeah. Cost and time involved in the repackaging boxes sometimes that people have. Uh, discarding, making digital. Uh, resources, lack of funding to resource processing and maintaining access to archives. Limited or lack of funding for specialists to help people understand and translate information held in archives. And the things to do with sector-wide agree agreements, no consistent box charges, can be no not transparent. Uh, digital information, we need to have uh, sector agreements on conventions and things like this. So, after all this, the archive group, we'd already come up with our aims, but we looked at our aims again and realised that actually the five aims we'd come up with were pretty much, if you jiggled them in a slightly different order, five aims that, uh, that, that the, all the groups came up with. So, this is our plan for the next five five issues, we hope, to solve. No. Yeah, alright, no. <laughs> <laughs> this is me being, yay, I'm going to come off the committee in a year, hopefully, so this will leave up to you lot. So, so this, hopefully, will be the, the archive group aims. No, this is what we feel that we can actually start to tackle. These are realist, these are, we think, are realistic targets. We don't want, we know that there's lots of issues. We wanted to come up with actually something that was realistic. Uh, we think it's a continue to find info. What we want is we, we, we're there. We want people, if they've got things, to come to the group and say, can you help? There's no point having a special interest group for archives if people aren't actually going to ask us whether we can help you. We want to set up something so that we're there. So we want to provide advice on, initiate, on, on monitoring of projects, especially where the museum's just closed or anything like that. We want to work with others, so we want to work with FAME and Algeo and the SMA and things like that. So we want to work with others and we want to solve sit to try and not solve the situation, we know it can't be solved. And we want to provide advice on rational, retrospective rationalisation of archive material in the store. So, basically, I would end up saying, I think the glass is probably half full. I would like it to be three quarters full. I think realistically, I, as an optimist, I'm saying it's a half full and not a half empty situation. Thank you.